Hello, everybody. Um, I want to thank you for joining me today, and I will be talking to you wonderful people about knowledge glaciers and the disappearance of institutional knowledge. I'm Emily Vox, and I work for the National Security Agency. A bit about me, in case you are wondering why I'm not wearing a suit and sunglasses like most of the feds you see in the movies. Um, I've been in security for over 11 years. I used to be on the artisanal side of security. Um, what that means is I followed a lot of checklists. I didn't really ask a whole lot of questions or kind of pontificate about whether or not there was a better way of doing security. Um, I didn't know a lot of developers or system admins very well. Uh, I understood what it was that they did. Um, but I was told to focus on continuous monitoring or ensuring that projects that were already rolling in production continued to maintain, maintain their security, maintain their security posture. Um, eventually, curiosity got the better of me, and as I see, it's gotten for you too because you're attending this conversation. Um, but. Now, I actually do a lot of very different things. I'm on a different side of security. Um, I'm the DevOps security lead for the National Security Agency. And over the past several years, my primary job is security advocacy and security architecture integration within the software development lifecycle. You see, I bridge two worlds, security and development, and they're definitely their own world if you talk to a security person or if you talk to a developer. Um, I was able to get to this point by spending a lot of time reading, spending a lot of time doing research, being integrated with developers and administrators, talking to development teams and their operations counterparts, understanding their pain points with things like getting an authorization to operate, why mutual authentication is such a pain to implement, how to manage secrets in the cloud, and so much more. To be clear, I don't know everything yet and I'm still learning a lot, but it's something that I enjoy and that I'm passionate about because I feel that if I can understand both sides, I can help deliver better solutions. So over these years, I've gained a lot of knowledge through my interactions with the amazing technologists at the National Security Agency and the critical missions that we support. And I've also grown immensely within the cloud native security community, first as a contributor, then technical lead, and now co-chair to the CNCF Special Interest Group for Security. So today I want to share with you some of what I've learned, some things that I've tried, some things I've observed, um, and things that are the result of either my efforts or others within the community. But before we actually get started, I want to talk to you guys about a couple things and level set. I do not possess a degree in knowledge or history. I'm not an educator. My degrees are in information systems, cybersecurity, and fine art. I'm not a computer scientist either. Um, I'm not a software engineer. <laughs> I'm not a system admin. I am a security person through and through. I just happen to know a lot about development and sustainment to be dangerous. The information that I'm going to be discussing today in this presentation is derived from over a decade of industry and government observation and research. They are not an official position of the federal government. Many roles, industries, and organizations are discussed in this presentation. One is not better than another, and I intend to present the actions and the effects of each of these in an observational manner focusing on the knowledge impact. So let's start. Knowledge glaciers are real and they're melting. If you don't know what a knowledge glacier is, or you may have forgotten since elementary science, here's a refresher. A glacier is a slowly moving mass or river of ice formed by the accumulation and compaction of snow on mountains or near poles. Hey, I'm, I'm Emily. Hey, yes. Sorry, sorry to jump in. I, I wasn't sure if you were uh, not uh, moving slides or- Oh no. Yeah. Hold on. Okay, let me jump back. <laughs> my apologies, everybody. Um, my slides don't have a whole bunch of content on them, but I will try to make sure that I don't pause the presentation again. So thank you for catching that, Brian. I appreciate it. Um, so the glaciers are actually melting. Scientific research has shown that the overall mass of glaciers on Earth is reducing at an alarming rate due to environmental factors beyond the glacier's control. And this should sound vaguely familiar to you as it seems like nearly everything in 2020 is beyond anybody's control. According to the National Snow and Ice Data Center, glacial ice often appears blue when it, it becomes very dense and free of bubbles. Years of compression gradually make the ice denser, forcing tiny air pockets out from between the crystals. When glacial ice becomes extremely dense, the ice absorbs a small amount of red light, leaving a bluish tint in the reflected light, which is what we see. This means that the oldest and purest parts of the glacier are the bluest. So what are knowledge glaciers? 
Knowledge glaciers are an accumulation and compaction of deep knowledge that's built over time that provides foundational understanding as community knowledge expands. And guess what? These are melting too. The advancement of technology, expansion of automation, consolidation of expertise, and many other factors are reducing the amount of and the completeness of institutional knowledge being transferred from one technology generation to the next. Over half a century of technology expertise has forged glaciers of knowledge. Accumulating or transferring this dense of knowledge is difficult and hard to successfully perform within a team, let alone an entire community. Years of knowledge compression have gradually made the depth and breadth of knowledge denser over time, forcing out those tiny time-specific and application-specific pockets of knowledge between innovation bursts. What remains is a pure foundation of knowledge from which innovation is born and then commoditized. Now, as with glacial melt, there are environmental factors to consider. Expected productivity and velocity. A culture of curiosity that generated innovation and upheaval is disappearing. Knowledge gained is evaporating because we are so busy trying to move forward faster than everybody else. Technologists are expected to be productive immediately. When organizations are getting more efficient and providing technologists enough information to get them moving in the right direction, they're not arming them with enough information to make better and more informed decisions. In this, technologists are being herded en masse to produce an object, a thing to be a cash cow of an organization. If it isn't making cash, how is it helping make cash? Career alignment. Career goals are being tied to product delivery. A lot of individuals see the success of developer advocates and big personalities in open source as the alignment of the stars for where they want to be. They see the product launch of a highly enviable project as the tra trajectory for their own personal success. Some in the community even hunt for the next cutting edge innovation to either launch them into stardom in the community or wealth to the next big thing. Organizations even encourage this model of thinking because it drives product development, further feeding that cash cow. Organizations need to reach beyond horizon one to horizon two and three, but in reaching these goals, they end up trampling the knowledge and growth of the individual to get there if they do not carefully nurture their continuation and advancement. Cloud. The birth of utility computing as a service in the early 2000s shifted industry away from self-management of power. Things like power space and cooling, racking, stacking, and cable management. Technology companies attempting to offer utility computing began to sweep talent pools for highly skilled and experienced costly individuals to make their offerings more robust, resilient, and competitive in the emerging market. Companies that began adopting as a service to reduce their IT costs end up decreasing local demand for hardware engineers and administrators. Few reinvested in these human assets to keep institutional knowledge within this uh, and expand their relevant skills. This further shifted labor needs Sorry, this further shifted labor needs to service providers, ultimately consolidating infrastructure management knowledge and leaving an entire formerly desired community to abandon and suppress knowledge and take up a new trade craft or evolve to meet the new market demands for which very few of them actually had expertise in outside of the service providers. Automation. Cloud service providers themselves have felt the IT cost burden and have been increasing automation to continually lower overhead costs and increase revenue. Automation of orchestration consolidates more knowledge and further dilutes the skills, history, and expertise from which its manual and descendant was created. Automation does many amazing things, however. Manual processes and procedures that were error prone can now be defined and exercised repeatedly with the same expected result. Do it once and apply it many times over. That knowledge about why we do it that particular way is not captured in the automation process itself, just the manner in which we accomplish the feat. How often do you find code without a comment explaining why it is there or what it does? Were you able to understand the comment without looking somewhere else in the docs? Would you be comfortable deleting it and confident in understanding the impact of that deletion? Do you ever revisit code of unknown origin? Abstraction. Cloud service providers, in an effort to protect themselves from their, and their customers from each other, institute layers of specialized controls and abstractions, limiting just how much you can tweak or configure their offerings. They need to make it easier and faster for their customers to move on to the next big thing in a safe way. And their customers want this. In many cases, the manner and mechanism by which this is performed is kept confidential and proprietary because it's the thing that enables them to be highly competitive within that market. 
it gives them that advantage. This is extremely difficult to understand. Sorry, this makes it extremely difficult to understand how a cloud provider is meeting compliance, security, and even regulatory requirements. Aside from a certifications body such as FedRAMP certification or a certification standard such as FIPS 140-2 being attested, consumers are left to trust but unable to verify many of these claims. So you're at the point now where you're wondering why is there a security person sitting on the other end of the camera talking to you about knowledge and glaciers it has to do with technology security, right? Or even just technology. Bear with me. There are two main points that are interwoven throughout this talk um, that I want you to be mindful of. Without knowledge, we cannot be informed. And if we are not informed, we cannot be secure. Consolidation and automation can make security life easier. Consolidation and automation without transparency can obscure and inhibit actual security. Security professionals and technologists cannot just know they're part of the development cycle, their fiefdom and be done with it. We must also have knowledge of the technology, how it fits into the bigger picture, the history of the technology to a certain extent, how it arrived here, all the historical vulnerabilities for it, because inevitably someone failed to implement a regression test for at least one of them. If we're not appropriately informed about how things function and why it is done, especially the why, we cannot make appropriate recommendations to mitigate, resolve, or even transfer risk. This is the exact same thing that project teams need to understand before they can begin developing a product. Identifying what the actual problem is before we can design a product to solve it. Identifying what the product's going to do in order to secure it. While consolidating reporting streams and automating a lot of manual processes like account creation can make our lives easier, we need things to provide context around those vulnerabilities we are seeing in a dashboard. If an exploit path is present, for instance, or if there are active or mature exploits in the wild. And we need to know the basis of that context because what we often see is difficult to discern relevance from, and we end up relying more on the automation to do our jobs than the actual skills that enabled us to do them in the first place. So I'm gonna give you an example. They didn't fully understand what was happening amid the confusing cacophony and warning alarms and alerts. They could not regain control killing a total of 346 people. This is an excerpt from NPR digging into why two 737 MAX airplanes crashed. It turned out Boeing's flawed design of a new automated flight control system was a major contributing factor. So I want you to think about this for a minute. We can destroy lives if we fail to take the time to understand. Without having transparency in how automation works, understanding what it is showing or where things are coming from, we can destroy lives. The more that we automate without transparency into how the automation works, without taking the time to understand it, we are losing valuable skills and knowledge that may eventually be catastrophic to another human being or even the entire planet. As we've seen in this past case, we need to pay attention and we need to make changes, but we cannot make changes until we understand how we got there. Our technology history is steeped in research and defense, seeking to understand and seeking to secure. We have moved very far away from this. And we've moved that far because we've lost our culture of curiosity as a community and the things that helped us cultivate that. Individuals used to spend months exploring the vast complexities of revolutionary computers and networks, learning how they operate, interact, and how they can be exploited. They retained and shared and published any details learned and enabled collaboration and breakthroughs only accomplished by building on decades of knowledge prior. This corpus of knowledge, or a glacier if you will, is the basis by which modern technology upheavals are born from. The, commodity, the commoditization of innovation, the building of more complex, higher order systems significantly reduces the learning curve to use each new capability because we assume that the knowledge gained to develop it is imparted to the generation using it. And this is not always the case. Christine Lagarde made the following comment on climate change that I think is particularly relevant to the current state of knowledge glaciers. It's a collective endeavor it's collective accountability, and it may not be too late. Consider that as we move forward. In order to win World War II, we needed to increase the input and processing of the existing computers we had. 
and they were human at the time, and we can only do so much with humans. IBM's ASCC, otherwise known as the Mark I, along with the electromechanical computers that of that era were designed to solve advanced mathematical physics problems to support the war effort. Soliciting knowledge across multiple federal and non-federal groups, the US was able to modify and improve the ideas of the EDVAC, Mark I, and eventually the UNIVAC. The need to increase speed and better tests for inputting data into this equipment led to the creation of the A-0, A-1, and A-2 compilers, which then led to the concept of keyboard input and then Fortran. These were major innovations in a long line of innovations that came before them, but for the purposes of this talk, we're going to start here. What were our innovations from the 40s and 50s? The methodology of actually writing code or software development was a byproduct of getting more accurate results from the Mark I. The concept of reusable memory was being exercised for the first time. We see programming tests being literally handwritten and then encoded to ensure the machines were configured correctly. And the concept of compiling code to enable more efficient use of the computer. As we continue to build on the success of electromechanical computers and many other technologies from that time, we're beginning to see computing take hold as a potential commodity. Technologists in the 60s and 70s realized we needed faster ways to communicate with this new medium and thus began the era of telecommunications. ASCII, BASIC, and UNIX are all key innovations here. But continuing on that collaboration idea, ARPANET now becomes the internet or a precursor of it, and emails are being sent. Pong has officially made its debut in this era. And thanks to the Apple I and Apple II, personal computing has potential, and we see text-based RPGs make an entrance. What were the innovations of the 60s and 70s? Email, the ability to send a message and receive a response faster than the Postal Service, faster even, potentially, than other communication mediums at the time. The internet or intranet connecting more and more people every single day. The concept of computer gaming, that computers could be used for much more than mere calculators and can provide an entertainment value to consumers. Microprocessors that enable computers to do more than just one thing. With telecommunications now being a largely expected presence for the future of any organization's success, we're seeing network systems becoming the next commodity enabling technical play and a rising counterculture looking to poke and pry at these existing wide open architectures. With more and more people owning personal computers and getting online or passing laser discs and now CD-ROMs with games on them around, curiosity is pushing people to test the limits of this new playground, using it in ways the creators never thought possible. Do you think that Grace Hopper or the US Navy would have ever predicted that the Mark I's ability to calculate trajectories to support a war could contribute to a community focused on entertainment? In the 1980s, the Morris worm wreaks havoc on the real internet. The first felony conviction in the US happens as a result under the 1986 Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Industry and government are starting to pay attention to the counterculture that is growing in the internet and freakers wreaking havoc in their wide open insecure telecommunications networks. What were our innovations of the 80s? Better memory, floppies, CD-ROM, flash, all contributed to our ability to continue refining and making computers more powerful. Word processing enabled more efficient and consistent communication within and across organizations globally. C++ was created and computer security awareness appeared in the media for the very first time. Think about how many times it's appeared since then. Everyone is now getting online and companies are seeing a new space, e-commerce, to increase revenue and reach new markets that they didn't even know existed. A growing need for security experts is becoming apparent and the internet is now the next commodity. In a rush to tap into the e-commerce potential, companies began buying compute. They bought space, they hired people, they needed tons of admins and developers to bring their brick and mortar presence online. Many of these individuals came out of that counterculture because they were the only ones with the knowledge of how these new systems and networks ran. We see skills like system admin, network engineer, and server hardware technician becoming some of the highest paying and highest demand jobs in the market alongside developers, but we also see configuration drift making its first appearance. Companies needed flexibility in making their online presence possible. And with the counterculture of freakers and hackers now becoming professionalized, we begin to see more open source in use. 
what were the innovations of the 90s? Linux, arguably the most widespread and most used open source project in existence. Web browsers, enabling internet access for companies and consumers alike to that e-commerce market space. Wi-Fi, which enabled technologists to move about free from wires and still be online. And online transactions, getting paid electronically for goods and services rendered only available now that e-commerce was alive. And Java, still one of the top languages in use today. Maurice Wilkes could not have said it better. This was the world in which I and others of my generation had grown up, and we saw the, the possibilities of achieving, with these means, very high speeds with elegant economy of equipment. However, Maurice Wilkes could not have predicted how relevant his experience would be across thousands of others almost 40 years later when he made this quote. With internet access, we begin to see the rise of e-commerce and digital startups to solve non-technology oriented business needs. Consumers will expect to buy things online through digital transactions. Service-to-service -service communications are emerging as the next commodity trend. Companies are now beginning to feel the pain of those IT gains from the 90s. Some making the drastic jump to create utility computing, seeing this as the next need by industry. Automation and skills consolidation that I talked about earlier are starting to happen. We begin to see the knowledge loss and skills abandonment. Organizations begin to shift and offload their technical debt in favor of outsourcing homegrown and unsustainable solutions to companies arriving on the scene that can solve these problems for them. Teams focus more on doing one thing well, and I mean really well, and selling the service. The beginnings of career and product alignment appear as individuals dive deeper on major problem areas. Agile and DevOps make an appearance and gain a following. As more and more companies realize waterfall development is simply not sustainable for reacting to market changes. Teams are relying heavily on the most senior person, and as Ian Coldwater put it, recognized by the epic beard or fabulous hair, to come in and save the day and then disappear in a cloud of smoke when your metrics, if you even had them, started flashing green again. So what were our innovations? Utility computing. It only exists because of the networking languages and the compute that came before it. DevOps. Recognizing siloed teams cannot be enough for high velocity product delivery. An agile, a better way to develop software. These are all great things and we've done a lot as a community. The world isn't on fire. Arguably it is, but that's not the point of this talk. So consider this, in order to work on the UNIVAC in 1951, you had to have an advanced mathematics background and experience in a very, very exclusive field. Today, you don't even need to be familiar, familiar with the fundamentals of networking to create an e-commerce site in AWS, or even be strong in any programming language. We've made it that easy. But what is the cost? We are relying on the tools we use to work properly. And when they break, there are very few individuals who know how things work before those tools were integrated or why we chose that specific tool to do that particular thing. And a lot of them are actually nearing retirement. In less than 30 years, we will have lost most of the generation that gave us the chance to create and experience Netflix, Alexa, and Fortnite. And this is where we're at. We've got developers cranking out code using build kits and pipelines to make their lives easier so that they can deploy their ideas to production. And this is great. We've got admins and operators cranking out the same scripts and watching the beautiful colorful charts reporting all microservices are green with no error codes. How many of us know what those metrics are actually looking at to determine green, yellow, red, or death? Or what the script we copied from Stack Overflow actually does? where that dependency came from and what else it has in it. This is the struggle, balancing velocity with knowledge. The epitome of security is knowing as much as you can about what you have, what you will have, what you don't have, so you can implement a balance of security controls and compensating mechanisms to ensure your customer's data does not end up plastered all over tomorrow's news headline. There is a huge part of me that wants developers and admins to know everything about what it is that they, they do. Take the supply chain, for instance. Do you know where that library actually came from? Are you sure that you spelled that package name correctly? In the age of Kubernetes and everybody getting fancy with the names of their projects, 
it makes it so easy for you to get owned because of a typo squat. But I realize I can't expect everybody to know everything, no matter how much I want them to. There's another part of me that wants them to know everything about security while they are coding or deploying, because then it makes my job easier. Although I also probably wouldn't have a job if they did, but I can't expect them to know security or be able to download my brain so they can make better decisions. It's not realistic. We only have so much room in our personal knowledge base. Something has to go. And for most of the technical community, it's not what they do every day or every week, then it's prone to getting lost and the glacier starts to melt. So how do we enable ourselves to innovate? How do we build on the knowledge of others in an informed and transparent way? How do we ensure the security of what it is that we're building? We build on the knowledge that was formed before us. If you can't understand how it works today, how it worked yesterday, you can't get to where you need to go. You need to engage in systems thinking, understand it end to end as much as you can. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And if the documentation sucks, submit an issue and take the time to be specific and provide a recommendation if you can. The extra five to 10 minutes that you spend explaining it will save someone else an hour trying to understand it. Share information universally to advance knowledge. Share what it is that you learned and solicit feedback from others. Make it easy for everyone else to get involved and help. You need to amplify those feedback loops to become actionable. Give a talk on what it is that you learned or what you did. Listen to what other did, others have done. Read the words they took the time to write and don't do it in a vacuum. Be okay asking for help or asking for an explanation. Be accepting that others need knowledge and be willing to share it. We need to promote and cultivate a culture of continual learning and experimentation. We lost it and we have to get it back if we wanna to continue to innovate. We need to accept the challenges that come with this and enable changes to make it safe to fail fast. I went through a whole lot of stuff and I went through it very quickly. So if you happen to have fallen asleep and are completely lost and don't understand how to save the Nalkins glaciers, don't worry. Here's a quick recap. Nurture the people that you have to expand their skills. Do not abandon them. You need them whether or not you realize it yet. They provide a unique experience and can diversify your way of thinking. Encourage your teams to learn together. No one individual can be responsible for successfully relaying institutional knowledge. Not everyone is a born educator and some people just don't like talking and that's okay. Give them opportunities that suit them to collaborate and shine. Documentation is important but making documentation available and easy to understand is the most important thing. We cannot save knowledge if we cannot find it or if we can't understand it. This also means making it available in multiple languages and multiple mediums. If someone took the time to write it down, it needs to be read. Make the time to read and encourage others to do the same. Find the balance between velocity and knowledge and we can save the knowledge glaciers. Thanks everyone. So I am going to stop sharing so I can jump in the chat and see what kinds of questions I have. That was great, Emily. Yeah, it was your, your check in that. Um, yeah, it's, this is spot on. I mean, this is uh, really um, my, my own personal job, being able to find people that can, that know assembly even or, or COBOL um, that we need um, you know, to work on systems, it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, that knowledge is, is, is gone and it's, it's really hard to find. I don't, I don't even know if assembly is taught anymore, it, you know, in college. I mean, so yeah, I mean, it, it seems like there's everything is, is just get it out quick, ship it fast. Um, you know, just run this routine and, um, no, this is, uh, and I, I'm trying to read some of the comments here. People are yeah, lots of great comments. It, it's very much true. Uh, Scott made a, a good summary of it. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, but when they inevitably die, it is a long way down. It, the problem with lack of knowledge, like um, 
people don't understand the concepts behind uh, telecommunic basic telecommunications or electronics or radio or they have this overwhelming fear to try to figure something like that out and that's really where we have to as a community like move forward and overcome that so if you're at an event and you have questions ask them don't be afraid to put yourself out there i know that it's a really hard thing software developers and even security folks are mostly introverts but you're among introverts and you're you're among the community and the family um, so Brittany had a question uh wondering if there are any institutional initiatives that could help support the effort to preserve the knowledge glaciers especially at a university level could there be government programs to help incentivize and support the preservation of these skills I don't know of any institutional initiatives that kind of work in this space. Um, the only way that I've been able to actually dig into a lot of these topics is through lots of reading. Um, Exploding the Phone was an excellent book to talk about like the 70s and 80s. Um, actually in the slides deck, which I had linked, um, there is a book on the information age, which has a lot of really great information from the 40s and 50s and how we got there. Um, you kind of have to like dig through YouTube talks. I mean, YouTube, if you want to talk about institutional initiatives, YouTube is probably one of those things. <laughs> if somebody has got something to talk about, they're going to record it and post it there. Going to conferences like these that make um, the videos open and available, those, those are really the, the, the mediums to do it. Um, Matt had a question. Any thoughts on the last point, finding and preserving knowledge for teams? Typically, typical challenges in KMS and intranets isn't so much as getting things written, but it's still a big pile of notes which rot. That, that's very much true. Um, there's, so depending on your organization and how much support that you have, especially if you are dedicated to improving the developer experience, which um, NSA actually has a team of folks, I'm, I'm on that team, as well as a couple of others that have talked at this conference, you need to like put together a documentation library and socialize that that is the place for everybody to go. And don't just keep it with a few people that have right access. You need to crowdsource input, make it an inner source effort within your community or within your organization. Um, you're best folks that are going to have the most knowledge are probably not going to be the ones with time on their hands to sit around and write a few articles for it. So you need to have that champion that's going to them and picking their brain or encouraging them or standing behind them, clapping and pushing them along to get those articles written and get that knowledge out of their brain. Because ultimately they are that one person that comes in and saves the day and you need everything in their brain for the next generation. Cause they're gonna wanna leave, they're gonna wanna retire, they're gonna wanna go on vacation and you need all of that knowledge. Um, so I'm catching up on chat. Uh, and a Kevin says, in a professional sense, one of the worst feelings is when you fix something and the institutional knowledge is no longer available. Yes, that is very much true. There is, especially as we move into this next decade, 2020 and beyond, there's a lot of changes that are going to be coming up um, on the horizon within the technology and even within the security community. Security has kind of been hanging in the background, watching everything in the cloud and cloud native happen. And now we're starting to see a little bit more of a push forward. So getting those things documented, considering how the thing, the ways in which we've done security in the past or the ways in which we have done technology, virtual machines, infrastructure as code, fully documented about why we've made those decisions is going to be important for the next generation of security and technologists that need to come back and revisit. Because one day serverless or the thing past serverless is going to blow up and it will be the next commodity. And we're going to be sat sitting around scratching our heads like, Han, do you remember back in 2005 when AWS launched? How did that happen and how did we get there? And now we're dealing with serverless and then whatever's gonna happen beyond that, that's even scary to think about. It's like it's like lab, lab audits. I used to manage a lab and we had to show the auditor exactly, okay, this file resides on this, you know, 
mainframe here and now like with the cloud well, where does it really reside it's it's everywhere like we're, we're, you know who owns it and where does it if you needed access to it you know there's very yeah. very uh confusing now yeah sujit made a good point um that there's sometimes a pushback against basic computer science knowledge and i i talked about this a little bit and that everybody wants you to be productive immediately and that means that the organizations and colleges are not necessarily teaching the history like usually there's a computer history class that you're going to take but realistically the idea is to get you the skills that you need to get out the door and get the job that you want because that's what you want to do is you need to start paying back all those student loans and you want to be successful but having the ability to contextualize what basic computer history and basic computing knowledge is most important for where you want to go is key and being able to identify that figuring out if i'm a web front end developer what things in history what were those big things that pushed it forward that i can leverage in the future because having that thread all the way across the timeline allows you to think at a bigger picture and think at a strategic level instead of a tactical level where you're staying in your own swim lane and only focusing on what it is that you do and that's what really allows people to be successful all those big personalities and open source that are giving all those fabulous talks, their ability to think strategically because they had the knowledge behind them is what's making them successful. I think I've got another question. Whoa, I've got a lot of questions. Oh, I answered this. Um, Brittany wanted to know if the talk is going to be posted anywhere. We, we are recording um, and I, I believe that they are gonna be made available um afterwards um so there is joshua has um posted an excellent point in a chat from the ieee standards association uh we're making a big move to support open source incorporated into big standards do you think that this could play a significant role if we had a healthy community developing consensus standards and better improve our best practices technology specs and conformity assessment programs so this is it, it's funny that you mentioned that joshua because i literally was just having a conversation with a colleague um today about that that there is everybody seems to be afraid to create standards and specs within the open source community because heaven forbid we have to follow something everybody wants to do their own thing and in fact all of our missions and the things that we're working on are all slightly different but i think at some level having a framework extracted is important for the community to move forward with and definitely getting active involvement not only from industry but from academia and from government in the same room having those conversations because ultimately problems that either you're seeing today or you're predicting in the next five years is probably something that someone else is already dealing with and they might have even already solved. So definitely putting something like that together would be a huge benefit to the community. But again, it has to be made in, in a way that's understandable and digestible to the majority of the community and even still making it available for everybody that isn't considered in the majority. We need to do a better job of reaching out um let's see lots of good points lots of excellent chat i'm glad everybody liked this i i do want to do a quick shout out this talk would not have been possible without a conversation i had with kelsey hightower about this particular topic so um big props to him for kind of pushing to make this known contextualizing is key yeah it, like if you're in an organization and you're getting pushback from your leadership or from your teammates about documenting things, just one thing will happen and then everybody will be like, oh, we should have wrote that down. And don't let it go. Be the dog with the bone about it. Keep writing them about it, that they need to actually take the time and document these things. Because thinking about it and having hindsight about it is not gonna solve the problem. If you're doing blameless postmortems, that's great. If you're not, please start doing them, but do the next thing after. Actually read through them and take your lessons learned and turn them into issues and tickets to get resolved by your teams. <laughs>